She went upstairs to make her bed, and not one word to her mother said. Folk music was in my blood, says Peggy Seeger. I loved it from the time I was born. Being given a background where I could understand it and carry it forward, I was totally and completely lucky. And so were we. Her deep understanding of folk music's value, both as a performing art and social music, keeper of ancient tradition and voice for the voiceless, made Peggy Seeger one of the most influential folk singers of our time. Not the most famous, she never sought that, but influential in shaping what would become the commercial folk revival and all that came afterwards. In the 1950s, no one had heard anything like Peggy Seeger, singing strong and confident about what it's really like to be a woman in olden times and today. And oh my, is that a girl playing a banjo? Well, she wouldn't say yes, wouldn't say no. All she do is just set the so. Set the so, set the so. All she do is just set the so. Then there were her own songs. One of her earliest, The Ballad of Spring Hill, has been sung by everyone from Peter, Paul, and Mary to you too. In the town of Spring Hill, Nova Scotia. And traveled so far, many believe it's traditional. Her gonna be an engineer helped launch the modern feminist movement. When I was a little girl, I wished I was a boy. I tagged along behind the gang and wore me corduroys. Everybody said I only did it to annoy, but I was gonna be an engineer. It's a good thing Peggy liked folk music, or she would have had a miserable childhood. It was everywhere. Her father, Charles Seeger, was a towering figure in the folk movement, a collector and scholar who virtually invented the field of ethnomusicology. Her mother, Ruth Crawford Seeger, wrote brilliantly simple, authentic transcriptions for classic folk songbooks by John and Alan Lomax, B.A. Botkin, Carl Sandberg, and her own children's collections that were sung by millions. The family sang in the evenings by themselves or with guests who dropped by like Leadbelly Leadbetter and Woody Guthrie. And of course, older half-brother Pete Seeger. Whenever Pete dropped by, Ruth let the kids stay home reasoning they'd learn more from him than their teachers. Even getting lost in a department store when she was seven brought Peggy closer to folk music. A female employee returned her to her mother, who hired her on the spot as their housekeeper. She was Elizabeth Cotton, of freight train and shake sugary fame, and was soon teaching guitar to Peggy and her brother Mike. It's not every home where the kids volunteer to do the dishes so the cook can teach them to finger pick. By seven, Peggy was playing the piano and soon added guitar, banjo, concertina, auto harp, and Appalachian dulcimer. At ten, she was helping her mother write transcriptions. In her twenties, she traveled through Europe with her banjo, but no plans to play professionally. She changed her mind for the most sensible reason. She ran out of money in Paris. A trip to the Soviet Union and China got her in trouble in the U.S., forcing her to remain abroad. In England, Folklorist Alan Lomax introduced her to singer and playwright Ewan McCall. How she describes that says everything. I met Ewan March 16, 1956, at 10.30 in the morning. How he described it says everything, too. When McCall wrote, The first time ever I saw your face, that was Peggy's face. The first time McCall was, like Peggy, a passionate populist, gifted songwriter, and powerful singer of traditional songs. It was a partnership from the very beginning, Peggy says. For over 30 years, they worked, sang, and toured together while raising three children. They became the first family of British folk music, 
just as the Seegers were in America. And they wrote powerful topical songs, sometimes for concert halls, sometimes for protest rallies, about war and peace, the environment, civil rights and workers' rights. Peggy brought a keen wit to her political songs, fuming about why being a housewife is not considered a job, and suggesting a proportional response to rude smokers, farting. With wages so low, prices so high, budgeting must be meticulous. The hours I spend in looking for bargains and cooking is really ridiculous. And though my man's doing all that he can, what he brings home isn't making his meat, and I'll have to go out for a wage myself that the family's going to keep eating. For a satirical review in 1970, she wrote Gonna Be an Engineer, about the social expectations that kept so many women from following their dreams. The song spread like wildfire. Peggy says it wasn't about her, that she never wanted to be an engineer, and nobody ever told me I couldn't do things. Remember, dear, that you're a girl. Women's music legend Holly Near says, sometimes a song puts an idea into the air. Peggy wrote that before I knew I was a feminist. Through it all, Peggy showed us that folk music belongs to everybody, and that a folk hit is not measured by sales, but by how it moves the human heart, encourages a woman to live her dreams, a housewife to be proud of her important job, a shy person to tell someone, put out that cigarette or else. But perhaps her true legacy is best found where you'd expect it, in her songs. In the presence of fighters I find a new peace. In the company of workers, replenish myself. Of miners and weavers, of rebels and dreamers. When I sing of my brothers, I sing of myself. That's not a bad description of folk music today. When I sing of my brothers, I sing of myself. And if you look at that sturdy, welcoming place where folk music lives today, it's hard to find a single plank, frame, or foundation stone that Peggy Seeger did not help fashion and fit into place. Turns out, she was a pretty good engineer after all. I come to your country Stranger